It's back to school, that time when parents take their kids shopping for new school clothes and supplies. And of course, parents celebrate their kids getting back to a normal routine. They share the excitement of a whole new school year and brace for all the germs that you know your kids are gonna bring home. Yep, we're talking about back to school sickness today. Parents probably won't be surprised to hear that kids can get eight to 10 colds a year. Most of those happening between October and May and if that cold lasts two weeks, your child can spend nearly half of the school year sick. But fear not, parents. We have all the tips and tricks you need to know to keep your kids and your family healthy this school year on Prescription for Life straight ahead. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Monica Robbins. It is an exciting time of year for our little ones, but back to school also means back to sniffles, back to coughs, back to stomach bugs. You know what I'm talking about. Sleepless nights, lots of tears and buckets by the bed. Being a parent of a young one in daycare or school is not for the faint of heart and those colds can ravage the entire family. It starts with the little one and before you know it, the entire household is down for the count. So what do you do to keep your kiddos healthy during the school year? Well, colds are inevitable. There is no magic potion that is going to prevent them all together, but there are some ways to minimize the impact of the inevitable. We turn to our Cleveland Clinic expert for more. We are joined now by Dr. Gina Robinson, a pediatrician with Cleveland Clinic. So glad you're here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It is back to school time and all the parents are scrambling, trying to get, you know, all of the supplies the kids need. Is that going to include cold and flu medicine? Probably a little bit more than usual. There's always a few handy things that people like to have, have around, but I think last fall kind of put a scare in people and they're probably gonna be extra prepared this fall. So what are the things that parents need to be aware of? I mean, how many colds do kids get mm -hmm. every year? People are always surprised to hear that kids can get eight to 10 colds in the cold season. So that's not throughout the year, that's concentrated in the fall and winter and early spring. So that can end up being every couple of weeks, it seems like my child is sick and people come in and say that all the time and that they are kind of getting over something and getting something else. There's always a germ waiting in the wings to take its place on center stage. There's, that's a lot of missed school. It can be, especially with fevers. We don't want kids to go to school when they have a fever. You're more contagious at that time in the illness. So it can end up being a lot of missed school, but it can also end up, you know, if we're not overreactive to symptoms, not being too bad. What about when the kid comes home and gives it to everybody else in the household? Yeah. Is there any, any way to sort of kind of prevent that? Unfortunately, it's hard because often we are contagious before we even have really symptoms that we're aware of. But um, washing our hands carefully, uh, trying to uh, be careful about that part will help to reduce some of the germ spread. And then also when someone is sick, having them kind of stay on the couch or stay in their room, they don't have to isolate themselves necessarily in the house, but just keeping them in, in one area and trying to keep them from spreading everything around the house is a good idea. All right, I'm gonna ask you to be a fortune teller. We don't know what the season's <laughs> going to be like, but um, what would you advise parents? Make sure you have this in the medicine cabinet. Yes, I would recommend that parents have some type of fever reducer and don't be afraid of fever itself because fever is part of the body's response to the illness. So you don't have to feel like you have to jump on every fever and get rid of it, but you do want to keep your kids comfortable. And when the fevers are getting high and they're achy and uncomfortable, well, that's the time you want to use your acetaminophen or your ibuprofen. Uh, cough suppressants, you know, I'm not a big fan of cough medicines in general, but sometimes you're coughing all night and you can't sleep and you need a cough suppressant. So for an elementary school age child and up, I think it's okay to, to try a dose of something to try to quiet down the cough and get some sleep. And then the good old fashioned things like tea with honey and lemon and lozenges. Chicken noodle soup. Chicken noodle soup. With stars. All, and, and all, all the that fun stuff, stuff. All the fun stuff, <laughs> a blanket, some good movies to watch. So mm -hmm. you talked about fever. Mm -hmm. When is it time that parents need to be concerned about fever? And it, it depends on the age of the child. So when we're talking about a newborn, we're concerned about anything above 100.4. We're considering that a fever that's concerning enough to at least call your pediatrician, if not bring your child in to be seen. When you're older than two months, 
the fever can go a little bit higher. And sometimes people get worried when fevers go up to 104. Um, that's high, but it's also possible to have a fever that high with a viral illness. So I tell parents, look at your child more than you look at the temperature at least in the first couple of days of the illness. Another thing for the little ones who are going to daycare, we know, I, I refer to school and daycare as Petri dishes in the beginning. Oh, yes, absolutely. So what do, what do those parents need to be aware of and how do you protect your kid from, you know, everything that's swirling around out there? I advise that parents accept that their children are going to get something. Right, we don't know what that's going to be, but if they're going into that new setting, they're going to be exposed to new germs, they're going to get something. I call it the initiation period. And if you go in the fall and winter, your initiation is gonna be a little bit rougher than it would be at other times of the year. So prepare for something to come along. Um, prepare to try to keep your child comfortable and hydrated. Talk to your doctor about what serious symptoms are and when you need to be concerned. As a pediatrician, I always wanna make sure that my parents know this is when I want you to be worried. This is when I'm worried. So this is, um, but don't be worried about these little things or these smaller things. So what much. are those serious symptoms then? So fever that you can't bring down is concerning. Fever that's lasting more than a couple of days at the beginning of an illness any signs of respiratory distress with the fever. So a child who's breathing rapidly, who's wheezing, whose nostrils are flaring or they're retracting. You can see their ribs when they're breathing. They just seem to be using a little bit more effort to breathe. A child who's not staying hydrated. So if you have a child with a viral illness and they're vomiting and having diarrhea and you can't keep up with what they're putting out, a toddler who's not having wet diapers or an infant who's not having wet diapers or their mouth is looking dry, a child who's really lethargic. And when I say lethargic, I mean not I'm less active than normal. I'm still running around, but I'm on a lower speed, but I'm laying on the couch. I don't want to do anything. I'm out of it. Those are really concerning symptoms. So uh, let's let's go to vaccines okay. because this is the time of year we tell folks, you know, hey, all the kids need vaccines mm -hmm. to go back to school. So let's start with the basics and what are you concerned about um, relating to the, the general vaccines most kids need? I'm concerned about people taking the flu a little more seriously and getting flu vaccines. I think because we call everything the flu, I've got a stomach flu, I had a mild flu, but when we're talking about influenza, influenza can be deadly even in this day and age with all the medical technology and advances that we have. So I really want people to take the flu a little more seriously and um, at least talk to your doctor about getting your flu vaccine every season. Kids who are under age two, older adults are definitely more at risk for higher complications with influenza infections, but anyone is susceptible. And the, the big vaccine everyone's been talking about, the COVID vaccine. Yes. Are you recommending children get that? I am recommending that children get that, not only because um, we don't always know how people will react to COVID disease, uh, the more people who are vaccinated, the safer we are as a community. So we want to think about not just ourselves, but our grandparents, our neighbors, our friends, our kids' um, classmates. There are kids who are going to school who are immunocompromised, who have conditions that make them a little bit more at risk. So we want to think about them also. Can you get the flu and the COVID vaccine at the same time in a child? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Oh, good to know. Yes, okay. I always say get it over with at once. Why risk that you might react twice as opposed to once? And when I say react, I mean you're sore, you have a fever, you're achy, the normal kind of reactions we see after a vaccine. And when you see a lot of people get concerned about those reactions, yes. can you explain why those reactions are actually a good thing? So that is actually telling you that your body is responding to the vaccine. It's doing what your immune system is supposed to do. It's making those antibodies. That's what you do when you get an illness too. So you're body recognizes that that germ or that piece of the germ as in the case of the vaccine and it makes those antibodies so when you see it again you have a head start on fighting that illness off RSV everybody's yeah. been talking about RSV because it popped up when it shouldn't have yes. but now going into cold and flu season this is normal mm -hmm. this is when we're going to see it but now mm -hmm. we're, there's a vaccine yes yes so there actually have been um, treatments for RSV that have been around for years there are monoclonal antibodies, which are different from the vaccine. We're actually giving antibodies to someone. So we've been doing that for premature babies who have higher risk factors for RSV disease for years. 
But now there's actually a vaccine that's come down the pike that's um, been recently approved for pregnant women and also um, adults over age 60. And then there's also monoclonal antibodies for children that have recently been approved. We're still in the process of figuring out how they will fit into the regular vaccine schedule. So these vaccines are, are they're preventative or they're to lessen the severity? Actually, they're both. Ideally, they're preventative, but when you have some antibodies already, it will help lessen the severity of the illness as well. So pregnant women, I know, you know, they're dealing with a lot to mm -hmm. begin with, and I know you're a pediatrician, but what's your recommendation? I am recommending that um, the pregnant women, it looks like the studies are in, the vaccine is safe. Um, of course, we continue to study things after they're introduced to the, the mass market, but I've seen what RSV can do in infants, and I would recommend that they really have a good talk with their um, provider and consider getting that RSV vaccine. So even though we're heading back to school, it is still warm. Kids are still going to be outside and playing. If there's something you could shake parents to make sure they understand, what would it be? Gee, I don't know, there's so many things, but just um, let your kids go outside, have fun. Don't be afraid of them getting dirty. Um, know that they're going to get something. Remember to wash your hands, try not to touch your face. If you are sick, take a look at what symptoms you're having and consider what you need to do in that individual instance. Any final advice for parents? Uh, have fun with your kids, they grow up fast, and just be aware, be ready, but don't be um, hypervigilant because um, we're all going to get something at some point, unfortunately. And that's so, not a bad thing. Yeah, it's not a bad thing because then you're stronger the next time you see it. All right, Dr. Okay. Robinson, thank you so much. You're welcome, it was my pleasure. So the moral of the story, your kids are going to get sick, but hopefully you can keep those colds to a minimum. When your little one does get sick, there are ways to make them more comfortable while they fight it. Here's more from our Minneapolis station. If your child has a fever, obviously fever reducing medicine like children's Tylenol is an option. Just check with your doctor about what kind and how much you can give your child for their age and weight. But beyond medicine, there are things you can do to make your child more comfortable when they're sick. First, a lukewarm washcloth on their head or lukewarm bath can help evaporate some of the heat they're feeling. That's a tip from Dr. Nancy Waller, pediatrician with M Health Fairview. You can steam up your bathroom by turning on your shower pretty hot and just having kids sit in the bathroom for about 15 minutes and breathe that kind of hot steamy air. Of course, humidifiers are great too, but Dr. Waller says be careful how hot the water in it is in case you have a toddler or curious child who might tip it over. Dealing with a cough, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta recommends having your child sleep at an incline because many times that coughing is caused by postnasal drip. However, that's only for older children because the safe way for babies to sleep is flat without anything in their crib. The CDC also recommends honey for throat pain and cough, but only for children over the age of one. The priority though, making sure your child doesn't get dehydrated. And the goal really is to make them more comfortable so that they'll want to drink a little more, stay hydrated while they try to fight off their illness. And if you think parents like you are getting sick more than your child-free neighbors, you're right, we verified it. Every time I visit my nieces and nephews, I come home with just a little scratch in my throat. I'm even more impressed when parents seem just not faced by the colds or runny noses. Do parents have a better immune system than people without kids? The short answer is no, but parenthood does have some health benefits. My sources today are U of Health Jacksonville's Director of Accreditation and Infection Prevention, Chad Nielsen, a Carnegie Mellon University study, and a study from the Babraham Institute. The research indicates that parents of small kids, particularly under six years old, tend to be more sick than people who don't have kids. Nielsen explains that kids are often sick with the common cold, rhinovirus or adenovirus, which you don't develop immunity to. It's all about good hygiene and safe practices to keep those germs from spreading. Uh, most kids under six have very weak immune systems because they're maturing and growing. They also don't necessarily have the best hand hygiene or respiratory cough etiquette. Uh, and so that inevitably passes on to the parents. He says that cycle repeats every two to three months, whereas people who don't have kids usually aren't exposed to these viruses as often. One study done at Carnegie Mellon found that parents were 52% less likely to get a cold than non-parents, but they ended up attributing it to something more psychological. 
A 2016 Baberham Institute study found that being a parent seemed to rewire your immune system as much as the stomach flu does, but it did not find one immune system better than the other, just different. Nielsen says for all the aunts and uncles and other visitors who get sick after being around the kiddos, step up your hygiene when you're around the little ones, and that will help protect you from the common colds they often have. With your Verify, I'm Leah Shields. You're going to hear me say it about 10,000 times between now and May. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, and please encourage your kids to wash their hands too. Stay strong out there, parents. You can make it until next summer, I promise. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll be back here next week with another edition of Prescription for Life. I'm Monica Robbins wishing you good health.